All right, everyone. Thank you for coming back. Uh, my name is Tanner Dajme, and um, you know I am, I guess, hosting this uh, Overcoming Self Sabotage Roundtable, and this is going to be part two tonight. Um, and uh, we're very excited. Um, you know, we have Nathan and James back. We also have Holly and Denise, um, and we're really excited to have them both here and to be able to hear their input. You know, hear what they have to talk about today. Um, so thank you guys so much for joining. You know, I am a self sabotage my coach coach myself um, and just super excited to be here. Um, so yeah, who, who wants to introduce themselves next? Uh, I'm Nathan Francis. Oh, <laughs> go ahead. Go I'm, ahead. I'm Nathan Francis. Um, I'm 28 years old. I'm from a little town, a regional town, two hours north of Melbourne. Um, yeah, um, that's, 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 that's me. So. All right, let's just go, Bryce. I'll, I'll just call him out. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, I'm Bryce Cluett, uh, living in Canada right now, uh, self-sabotage coach, um, founder of the Man on Fire program that you know helps men transform into living with more purpose, removing distractions and removing their self-sabotage behavior um, and sort of living life and being a leader in, in all categories of their life. And I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Happy to have you. Uh, Holly? Hi, I am Holly Jean Mullen, and I am a nutritional therapy practitioner, and I have a holistic wellness practice here in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm also a certified self-sabotage coach, which goes hand in hand with people trying to change their diet and nutrition. And I'm also a podcast host on Real Health Conversations. Awesome. And Denise? Hey guys, my name is Denise Walsh. I'm a former clinical psychologist turned life and business coach and have a program called 90 Day U-Turn where I help people overcome self-sabotage and expect success as their normal, uh, experience success as their new normal. And I, this last year, started a nonprofit organization called Stop Suffering in Silence, where I work with trauma and trafficking survivors and truly give them the same program, but in a different, you know, with a, with a smaller more intimate cohort. And it's been so powerful to see the transformations within them. So I'm excited about this topic today. Awesome. So excited to hear about it. Um, I think or Holly was going to, we're going to jump into Holly's topic first. Um, so Holly, you want to start and we'll, we'll go into it? Uh, sure. So tonight I'm going to be talking about nutrition and how self-sabotage works um, in that whole arena of diet and nutrition. But I think what I have found, it's hard to talk to someone about nutrition if they don't also understand where you have come from, because it's easy to be like the no, do as I say, not as I do, I know better. So I think it's important for listeners to understand kind of like my own back journey. And it really is just that a nutritional journey. I feel like we are all in a relationship with food and it's probably one of the most intimate relationships that we have because um, our food relationships uh, also like it is with humans can be really great and happy or could also be dysfunctional and messy and abusive. And my weight has fluctuated my entire life. I was a fat kid, but then I was also an athlete. I have a history of yo-yo weight gains and losses. I've tried every fad diet. Embarrassingly, I used to say one of my hobbies was fad dieting. Um, I spent my 20s and 30s abusing my body with alcohol. I completely fell victim to the wine mom agenda and um, kind of settled my nutrition philosophy to be in the spectrum of balance. Um, but balanced eating never really felt balanced to me. It was always more like restrictive eating most of the time and then binge eating some of the time and thinking that that would balance itself out. But balance just led me back to that seesaw of going up and down in my weight. And for a lot of people listening, I know you may know this pattern well, like I did, and you understand that shame and the guilt and all that negative self-talk that comes with this balanced lifestyle. Um, and it wasn't until I started studying the subconscious mind that I learned about the root causes of overeating and binge eating, emotional eating, weight gain, body image. Um, and it wasn't until I started working with a coach myself that I learned the key strategies to help me break free from those patterns. And I think most people, when it comes to nutrition, 
and diet and health, they have an idea of what their sabotaging ways are. Um, I think most people understand that eating a gallon of ice cream and a bag of chips while Netflixing is not like a healthy way to live. But what most people I don't think understand is where those behaviors come from. And it's not a lack of willpower. It's not a lack of discipline, but it's the result of programming and your subconscious mind. It's taking in 40 million bits of information per second. And the subconscious wants to mimic that behavior and record it and repeat it. So what you consume goes well beyond food and what you put in your mouth. It's also your environment, the people who are around you. So number one, we ought to start hanging out with better people. Um, but because we're human, our DNA is just encoded to copy and mimic and emulate whatever we see. So to start changing, we need to expose ourselves to successful people, either online or in person or hang out with healthier people. Um, Cause if you're not eating foods that regularly bless your body, that make you feel great and give you the energy you need to fulfill your purpose and dreams, then you're not living your best life. But it does go a little bit deeper than that on the very practical level, the food that we eat now, our modern food is overly processed. It's devoid of nutrients. It's full of chemicals and additives and artificial everything. It is literally poison to our bodies. And our subconscious knows this. It knows that we are eating poison. And this makes us weak. And it makes us more dependent upon fitting in with the herd or the tribe. Um, I don't know what all we have covered in the, uh, previous episodes, but as, as humans, we are, we are tribal. We like to be with a group and there is safety in the group. And we prioritize that safety by finding um, commonalities within our, our tribe of people. And just like wounded animals or sick animals, they rely on the herd for safety and protection. If we are eating food that our body perceives as poison, then we are going to be more dependent upon the herd for our safety. Now, our subconscious doesn't know that what we're watching on TV or seeing in commercials or while we're out and about seeing marketing and billboards and stuff in the store, our brain doesn't know that that's just marketing and TV. It thinks that's, that, that's how we're supposed to be. So it's seeing messages to do whatever, look at our society, it's a mess. So full circle, when we're poisoning ourselves with food, we are more susceptible to taking in the messaging of the world and it, it's leading us down this path of not living our best lives. Yeah, great points. Great points, Holly, for sure. Um, I'm going to jump in because, um, you know, we all went through those, those journeys ourselves when it comes to um, starting to clean up our diet. And I think that was a pivotal moment for me uh, cleaning up my diet, I, I gained clarity. That's exactly the way I explained it. As soon as I started to eat better, um, I call it conscious eating, right? You start making those decisions about what you put in your body and it just comes down to choices. I think people need to understand uh, breaking free from the herd is something we need to do, right? So we always say like freedom from self-sabotage or uh, breaking out of that norm of what everybody else is doing. Um, and that's going to be key for people to start uh, understanding that making those decisions daily of what you put in your body is, is going to be of the utmost importance. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Cause you know, whatever you eat totally affects your whole body and it affects your mind as well. It's, it's all connected. Um, and you know, I think a lot of people kind of just go for like whatever is the cheapest option, the easiest option, you know, fast food or, Hey, you know, I can save a couple of dollars if I don't buy the organic, but they, they don't really understand like really what they, they are purchasing. Um, and just cause a lot of people just, they, they, they just trust what everyone else is doing. Oh, if, if, if everyone else is doing this, you know, it must be safe. If, if everyone else is, you know, um, you know, listening to the doctors, listening to whatever, you know, buying what's in the grocery store, then that, that food must be safe. And I think just like Holly talked about, you know, it's just cause we mimic other people and we are, we're prone to want to fit in. Really. Mm. A lot of people don't know um, where the food comes from either. Like a lot of these supermarkets, we call them supermarkets here. You guys call them grocery stores, but supermarkets here and here in Australia, like a lot of people just don't know where, where their food's grown. They, they they don't have that connection with the local farmers or the local organic farmers. Be like, well, this is where our food comes from. 
you know, we have a local organic shop here. I know that he gets the food locally and from a market down in Melbourne. Like I just know, and I know the guy really, really, really well. We built that um, relationship, so I know where the food's from. So that's another one as well. Another I just don't thing, know. Yeah, another thing I was thinking in speaking about nutrition is that oftentimes we aren't aware of how the food affects our bodies. Like we don't connect the two, you know. Mm. So the first step often is even doing that internal check after we eat. Like, how do I feel? Do I have more gas? Am I bloated? Am I feeling lethargic? Like, how do I really feel? Because we're just on autopilot and we're, we're doing what we normally do without really taking an inventory on how it impacts us. And I think so many times we are just on autopilot and we don't even realize. So like as a, as a psychologist, people would, uh, you know, people come in with depression and anxiety. And um, one of the first things we look at is your diet, your caffeine consumption, because all of that impacts our mood when we think it's the opposite. We think I'm depressed. So I'm going to eat a tub of, you know, ice cream or make brownies and eat comfort food. Um, when oftentimes the food itself can start the depression. I will say like, I think you're um, not the norm if you are even asking about diet and nutrition, because there, there is an absolute direct correlation, but um, at least what I see in my area and with my clients, because usually people come to me as a last resort of going to other people is that that is not normally what is asked about, but it is absolutely true because nutritional deficiencies, gut dysbiosis, um, blood sugar imbalances, those are going to lead to feelings of depression and anxiety and a, just a general feeling of unwellness um, that people will look to, oh gosh, I need a, a pill for this, or I need to take something for this yeah. rather than looking at what am I eating and making those connections of how it makes them feel. Right. Even kids, you know, in my psych degree, we weren't taught nutrition. It's just not even, a, it's not even a thought. But when mm -hmm. you start working with people, you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> you're eating all sugar. This is not good yeah. for you. And now you're having behavior problems, you know? So there's certainly links to how, what we eat and how it impacts our behavior. Yeah. Well, and I think, oh, no, you go ahead. I was just going to say, I think some of it comes back to, um, you know, in my sort of, when I'm helping my clients is leadership, right. Is taking onus on what you're putting in your body, how, like, like we mentioned, how does it make you feel, right? Um, this sort of, you know, we have this victim mentality of like, I'm just going to, I feel bad, I'm going to eat, and then I'm going to go to uh, go to the doctor for a quick fix. You know, the doctor is what helps me with nutrition when it, that's never been conveyed, right? Um, so I always come back to leadership and being like, you know what, you're in charge of what you put in your body. And you should be looking at that down to the, you know, the level of when we used to go to the grocery store and like read the back labels, right? I'd be standing there. I remember when I first started doing it and just reading all the stuff and then putting it back, you know, and then going again. And and now it's like, I know exactly. I go in there. It takes me five seconds to go get what I need and come out, right? Hmm. So I think leadership is a big part, getting people to switch out of um, like feeling like someone else is going to take care of you or outsourcing your authority to somebody else. Yeah. So we need people to get fired up and get I'm in charge of my health and and I can, you know, put stuff in my body. It's going to fuel it, or I'm going to put stuff in it. That's going to make me feel sluggish and, and not good. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I, I can, back. Oh, yeah. I completely agree with that because, you know, like the way the system's designed right now, it's really just, you know, we, we have to take care of our own health because otherwise we will be in a spot where our health won't be good because, you know, everything is set up where the you know food is just toxic, you know, the, the drinks, the water, um, you know, the media, everything is really set up in a way to disempower us. Um, and, you know, as unfortunate as that is, you know, the medical system isn't really there to make us healthier because it's just there to, you know, provide, um, you know, uh, solutions or, you know, problems to our um, symptoms, really. And it doesn't really address the root cause of the problem. Um, and so I totally agree with Bryce where we, we, we need to be that person who's taking, you know, our own health in our own hands because, you know, ignorance is not bliss because, you know, what you don't know can actually hurt you. And that's, it's a perfect example right now. We have the most technology we've ever had. We have the most information we've ever had. We have the most ability to keep our food cold and, you know, be able to get food from across the world that we've never been able to do, but yet we have the most unhealthy population yet. 
you know, what's going on. It's because people aren't taking care of their own health. They're just taking word for, you know, they're just following what everyone else is doing. And it's unfortunately, it's leading us all down a path that we can recover from, but we need to take action to, to do so. Yeah. I like to say that we are on a high fact diet because there is facts <laughs> and information yeah. everywhere. There's no shortage of information, but there's conflicting information, there's confusing information. And even if you're finding the right information, you still have to take that and have action. Information is not power. Action is power. Good point. I'm also yeah, reminded like of the people that say, oh, it's just in my genes. And Bryce, you mentioned no. taking your power back, <laughs> right? And I think that's a piece of it. Like, oh, this is just the way I am. This is the way my family is. And this is the way we do things here and that kind of stuff. And you think that's, again, just another example of putting it on someone or something else and not really taking that ownership. Yeah, we have yeah. all the knowledge and all the power inside of us. Yeah. And once we start to clean up our diet, we can start intuitively eating. Like our body will tell us what it actually needs. Yes. Because mine tells We're the me all only the time. species that wonders, what should I eat? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's true. What do I feel like eating? But I love that. Yeah. Like we've gone through those times of, you know, fat is bad, meat is bad, you know, all those different times. And if you start to to understand like somebody else is telling you what to do somebody else is guiding you to like go get the chips and eat the late night snacks and we'll hear you know everything in moderation we hear those bumper sticker slogans right when when you really get down to the subconscious part of it and realize you know consciously you need to understand why you're eating it's to fuel your body right we all want fun we all want pleasure but when you start to understand that you can find pleasure in feeling strong you can find pleasure in um, you know, feeling good about yourself and knowing that you're, you know, maybe you picked a uh, cucumbers that were made in your local town, right? Rather than the ones that were made in Peru or like, that's what I got to when, when I started conscious eating was why do why would I get something that's like halfway across the world? And when I can get something that's right next to me, like, um, it just sort of snowballed into becoming more clear about um, everything that I was trying to do. My purpose, right, was, was to eat healthy and fuel my body. And there's going to be times when, you know, you go out and you have something that maybe isn't the best for you, but getting back to that ownership of being like, I, I'm not going to feel guilty about it, right? If you feel guilty about eating something, you're going to shut down your whole sort of digestive system and you're not going to be taking any nutrients from it. Um, so I try to tell people that too, like guilt when you're eating, just get, get rid of it, right? Start yeah. taking ownership for what you're doing. I'm having a, I'm having a meal that's not the best for me. I'm going to enjoy it. Then I'm going to move on. Tomorrow's another day, right? Progression, not perfection. That's right. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, and I feel like it's important to address, like, you know, there's all these fad diets out there, like the vegetarian, the all meat. The, you know, there's so many different ones, right? And I feel like none of these work for every single person. Everyone has their own little um, nutrients and own like food foods that they should be eating because everyone's different and everyone. No, I think it really depends like on where you were, like where your ancestors, like what, what your ancestors ate and things like that. But also like it depends on what you've eaten as a child and like the nutrients that you've actually missed out on. Um, because a lot of us are just deficient in different nutrients. So we need to eat different kinds of foods um, and just to eat a wide variety of foods. Really, you can't go wrong with just eating actual food that's like grown and like not processed. Right. And that's not just sprayed with a ton of chemicals. That's, that's a really good starting point. If you're, if you're just like confused by everything, just make sure the food you're getting is not doused with chemicals, that it's, it's not processed and it's not been packaged and stored for years and years. And you, you'll be, you'll be at a very good starting point. <laughs> that's exactly the advice I give to my clients as well. It's like, just start with real food. And I don't even push for organic right out the bat. Like if someone's used to eating drive through all the time, I can't expect them to suddenly eat the cleanest diet. So it's like, okay, just start with meat and veggies. Let's start there. And it, well, let's not worry about quality. Like that can come down the line, but if you just need to start somewhere, just start with eating more food that comes from nature and less food that comes from a box. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and, and even teaching people that you know, having a plan, I always tell people in, that I'm co coaching, like, um, oh, look at puppy. <laughs> Just to have a plan, you know, to know that, okay, I eat, you know, I eat breakfast 
because I, I just fasted all night. I'm going to get some protein in me or whatever, but the whole, like just reaching for stuff in random times, or, um, you know, I see a lot of it here in Canada will have, you know, raising money for something, raising money for, for heart disease and they're selling hot dogs. Right. Or like, it's just consciously thinking, right. I just had dinner, but I'm out. And then I see somebody I want to donate to it. So I'm just going to eat a couple hot dogs. Like it doesn't make sense. Right. So you got to start thinking and having a plan about what am I doing? Am I trying to build muscle? Am I trying? Um, so just conscious, always trying to use that frontal lobe. Right. Hmm. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's a, a good point. Tanner brought up a good point with, we all have different needs. Like there is no such thing as a perfect diet. There is no such thing as a perfect diet for all people. And it is just prioritizing what are your goals? Cause there is no shortage of influencers or gurus on the internet telling you what you should be eating, but you don't know where they've come from. You don't know what their goals are and what they're telling you might not even apply to you at all. It might, it might've worked for them. It might work for the people that were there working with, but everything is so bio individual. You really need to filter it through that lens of what's right for me. And again, taking back your power as Bryce said, and it's like, we need to stop looking outside of ourselves for the answers for how we need to live our life and run our lives. But the other downside is, is you're never going to come to that point. If you're continuing to eat foods that are full of chemicals and highly palatable, um, flavors that are just going to keep you feeling like crap and addicted to eating those foods. All right. Anyone got any other points on it? Like I had some come to my mind, but it's more of a solution. So I'll save that for that part. <laughs> well, I've got one point to add. Jason talks about it. Um, it is a form of mind control too, but once you're consciously aware of it, you can make change and it's a program. It's, it's not actually you. And as, and during our coaching, we, we put out videos of Darren Brown or that max major video. You can be reprogrammed in a matter of two minutes. Two minutes is all it takes. So once you're consciously aware, you can start to make change. Fantastic That's point. Because, you know, yeah. there's a reason why, um, you know, uh, marketing companies and, you know, just giant corporations spend billions of dollars on advertisements every year and, you know, do product placement and things like that because yep. well, they, they know it works. And you know, the, the more uh, repetitions of something we see in our environment, uh, the more likely we're going to be uh, drawn to it. And so, you know, whether it is that the Coca-Cola can or the, 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 um, you know, McDonald's burger and French fries, Starbucks. you know, those yeah, Starbucks is so common, right? You know, those things are always in the environment, you know, look at the TV shows you're watching, look at the billboards when you're driving through those things all have an effect on us. And pretty much our subconscious mind is just playing a matching game It's saying, Hey, look, I saw this. I saw this. Look at all those people lined up at this place. Look, everyone has this like, Oh, our um, superhero, the flash is eating some kind of um, burgers and fries, you know, everyone's doing it. We might as well do it. You know, even the people who are super strong and healthy are doing it. Look, LeBron James is drinking a Sprite. They're like, you know, like it, it, yeah. it's all there. Right. Um, and so it, just like Nathan is talking about, it is creating those programs and we're just running them and, you know, we're not consciously thinking about it. So, mm -hmm. you know, getting that conscious awareness, looking into what's you're actually drinking. If you don't know what's in something, usually you shouldn't be uh, consuming it. That's another one I'll add too. Hydration is key. Like a lot of people are dehydrated. Like in, in my country and where, where I'm from now, like people are drinking their Coke, drinking their, well, we call them soft drinks. You guys call them sodas. It's the same thing. Like they're dehydrated. They're not, not even drinking water. Like, yeah, a lot of people just are running that, running that program of when they're stressed, when they're feeling the way they are, they'll turn to the Coke, they'll turn to the sugary drinks. So like, just get back to drinking some water and then educate them on, well, the water that you're drinking out of the taps, not real water either, but you know, just start hydrating yourself. Cause a lot of people out there are dehydrated and that's another problem as well out there. Yeah. And I think it, it comes back to taking ownership of your, of your life, right. When it comes yeah. to what you're putting in your body. So if you're consciously thinking about what you're eating, you wouldn't be drinking Pepsi first thing in the morning, right? Um, I'm sure there's people out there who wake up in the morning and they, you know, they have their habits, right? Um, when you start to become conscious, your habits are going to be conscious habits. They're going to be uh, hydrate first thing in the morning after, you know, not drinking all night. So um, once again, self-sabotage is so important when it comes to recognizing what it is and how it influences you. 
then you can flip the switch and use it to your advantage. And that's really what we all try to teach, right? Yeah, exactly. I think that's exactly what we're trying to teach, right? To, to be able to take care of uh, control of your own life. Because really what we want for other people is that they can go out and like change their life every single day where they don't need to come back for help, recurring help every time, you know, that they, they fall down something. They, they have the tools that they need and they can move forward, start moving forward in life and addressing, you know, you may not be able to make all the changes you want instantly, but you can actually start, you have a plan, you have the tools, you have every, you know, you have the things that you need to start moving forward. I think that's so important. And what can be instant is that decision that you're going to be different and then base every decision that you make off of the person that you want to be. How would the person I want to be do this? And to let go of being that victim and, oh, well, this happened to me in my life. We've all been through crap in our life. And you can let that be an excuse and a reason to say, "Mm, I can't do it. (laughs) Or you can say, hey, that happened. That's not who I am. And that's not going to carry with me into my future. I can decide right now that that changes. It might be a process changing, but you can make that decision. And it is a decision. It's not an I'll try. It's a I will. Mm. Perfect. Yeah. And I think that identities are so important because um, I know actually me and Bryce were having a talk when we did our podcast and he talked about, you know, what would a healthy person do when he was thinking about eating healthier? Like what would a healthy person do if would they, would they reach out and grab this, this cake right now, or would they go and, you know, go to the fridge and grab, you know, some fruits and veggies, would they go actual get some actual substance through their food. And I think that's so important because the, the identities that we assign ourselves and that we see ourselves in is kind of usually locks down our path. Um, it can be another program that we can hold ourselves back without even realizing it. Yeah, like I think that's a great point when we had that conversation I mentioned about a, a lady who all she did throughout her whole day was every decision she made around food was what would a healthy person do? And then she made the decision. And then the next time she was presented with hunger or a decision, she said, what would a healthy person do? And she just kept doing that and ended up losing like 100 pounds um, just from making those decisions. And so she became the identity of what a healthy person would do. Right. right? Perfect. I think we all have like tricks with working with people and doing that too. I know we're going to talk about the solutions, but it comes with like making sure things that you're seeing day to day repetitively reflect those changes in that person you want to do too. So it's like, if you're thinking, what would a healthy person do? Seeing what healthy people actually do reinforces those choices. Yep, exactly. All right. Well, we'll wrap this part up talking about the nutrition and we'll, we'll come back to it for the, um, the solutions because i think we all have a lot of different solutions we're we're excited to share uh denise uh, do you want to um, talk in about what you're here to talk about today yeah so i just wanted to share a bit about how i've been implementing the self-sabotage overcoming self-sabotage content with trauma survivors now what I, of course, like I'm specifically talking to what happened in the brain when somebody's experiencing a a traumatic event. But in reality, I also think most of the world is living in this chronic fight or flight mode all of the time. You know, we're living on this hamster wheel, experiencing chronic stress. We have limited relationships. You know, the people we see at work aren't people we're deep friends with. And we don't get to spend, you know, we're just, so although I'm I'm speaking about trauma survivors, really, I think this is helpful information for anybody. So when somebody experiences a trauma, a traumatic event, basically their brain freezes and they take a snapshot of everything that's around them, which is why often a survivor may not, like they might not have a good memory on a day-to-day basis, but they can remember details of their trauma. And we can all relate to that. I mean, think about where you were when 9-11 happened or when Princess Diana died or when these big life events happened, you remember exactly where you were, what was going on and our brain just like takes a snapshot. But what happens is your, your body also starts to excrete these chemicals and those chemicals are released throughout your body, putting you into the fight 
flight, freeze, or fawn mode, right? We tense up, our blood goes from our brain to our limbs. We uh, activate the sympathetic ner nervous system. And now we no longer can think. We just act. And we default to whether it's fighting or running or freezing or fawning. Fawning is like people pleasing and trying to ignore the situation and just like try, you know, again, you think domestic violence um, survivors, they are often trying to appease the situation and, and bring it down. And so what happens is that this can be the normal. You know what I mean? Like this ends up being the the way that um, a survivor just it think we think they think life is normal, especially if trauma happened in their first seven years, because then oftentimes those those patterns, the thought patterns, the brain patterns, and the physiological patterns are more hardwired into the body, and we will stay where we are even if we don't like it because it's normal, even if it, we take steps outside of our comfort zone in a healthy direction, it still feels awkward and weird and we snap back to what we deem normal. And so what I do with trauma survivors is help them to recognize that they're living in this chronic, I call it drama, like a state of drama. And once you know the difference between what it feels like to be in drama and what it feels like to be in what I call dream world, you know, like living in the world of dreams, versus living in the world of drama. I mean, we could call it calm versus chaos. We could call it panic versus peace. We could call it a lot of different things. But once you understand the difference and how your body feels in those different situations, you can then learn the skills to take yourself, as Bryce has mentioned, taking your power back, having that radical acceptance, radical honesty, and then taking 100% responsibility to shift your body outside of fight or flight and into rest and digest or rest and repair or um, parasympathetic nervous system activated. And there's a few ways that I teach people to do that. And we can certainly talk more about that in the solutions. Um, but what I think is fascinating for trauma survivors to know is that this is the way the body is designed to work. There's something called the Broca's area in our brain that is, it's, um, what's the word? It's like, it's, um, it's a part, it's in charge. That's the word. It's in charge of speech. And when you're experiencing trauma, it, it doesn't function. And so after a traumatic event, if you've ever, I mean, you can imagine somebody coming home or going to the police station and they're like, what happened? What happened? Tell us what happened. Like they, they physically can't speak. Like, it's not, they're not trying to be rude. They're, you know, there's reasons why our bodies respond to trauma in this way. And flashbacks are a similar thing. When the body starts to relax, then their brain can bring up a flashback that they haven't thought of in 20 some years. And so again, teaching survivors how the body and brain work and how, uh, what fight or flight mode really feels like gives them a space to say, okay, I'm not crazy. I'm not a, I'm not a weirdo. I'm, <laughs> this is how it, how I was made to work. My brain is really smart and I do have the tools to change it. And that's the coolest thing is because with epigenetics, we can turn genes on and off. We can retrain our brain to create new neural pathways. So we have new automatic thoughts and automatic behaviors. And even just again, like you guys have mentioned, bringing the darkness to light has given people so much power and room to change. I've had survivors say this is the best year of my life because they finally feel ownership of themselves and like they're not at the whim of the world around them. That's so awesome. I love that. And, um, you know, if I just want to talk a little bit about that, too, because I do I do see how people will go through those traumatic events. And they, that defines who they are, right? That's, that's what you said. Like your body goes into it almost like a shock. And then you sort of, everything around you relates back to that. It's always like, well, I'm, a, I'm, I'm this person. This is how I have to deal with everything now. Right. Yeah. Well, and I just want to mention often, especially when this, 
we are, we are taught that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. So if a bad thing happens to me, it means I must be bad. And so instead of saying the person who did the bad thing is bad, we often carry that shame ourselves. And then that becomes part of our identity, which we know is a part of that self-sabotaging because we will never we will never out earn, we will never out experience our own expectations. And so that just keeps the cycle going. Yep, I can completely, you, oh, you go for it. Oh, I just had a quick question. Can, can you speak to like, so you're working with people with traumas. Um, what about like micro traumas? Like if we're watching a terrifying movie or even just like a horrific Good. news report or something, I know you mentioned like we know where we were in 9-11 and stuff, but what about like if, if we're someone who is like listening to those murder podcasts and stuff. So those little micro traumas that we're ex- like self exposing ourselves to, does that have the same effect on the brain? Yeah. I love this question. And I know you guys know the answer, but it's exciting to talk about because because the reality is, is our brain cannot differentiate between a real, imagined, or a screened event, right? And so it's talking to our reticular activating system. All of anything we see in our environment is, is um, our reticular activating system is scanning and saying, is this important? Is this, uh, is this normal? Is this who I want to be? And, and it doesn't know. Your brain doesn't know if this is a movie or if this happened in real life. And so absolutely, yes. Yeah, I feel yeah, like I anything. Think... Oh no, go ahead. Your turn. Yeah, I feel like anything highly emotional, right, is going to have a really big impact on our subconscious yeah. mind. And I know for me personally, like when I hit like what I call my rock bottom, that was a really emotional point. I think for a lot of people who who have made big changes like that, like the reason why they will make those changes usually pretty quick is partially to do with what they know, but partially just to that 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 highly emotional experience, saying, "Hey, I know this is not right right now." You know, I I. I need to make some changes and that emotion can make some changes. So sometimes those emotional things can be a good kind of thing. Obviously you don't want to, everyone, no one has to go through like a rock bottom or traumatic experience, but those things sometimes are needed. So we can kind of get our, our kick in the butt and say, Hey, we need to start making moves because the, the universe just kind of gave me a swift kick in the butt and I need to start moving forward in life. <laughs> yeah, 100%. And back to uh, Holly's point. I, I see that maybe sometimes people will be in that cycle of a traumatic event. They they like that that chaos. Maybe they grew up with chaos, and then they they get drawn to the the crime dramas and the you know the Kardashians, like the constant drama in their lives, right? And that's who their identity is. So they identify with it on TV. So we always talk about you know removing distractions, and that's part of it, right? Just a simple thing of removing that distraction not becoming somebody who's drawn to it. And then, you know, you're somebody now who gets drawn to positive reinforcement, right? So um, definitely ties into what we talked about. Well, and there's a reason why survivors are re-victimized. And it's, you know, part of it is self-worth. Part of it is going back and, and maybe even not recognizing red flags, but it's, it's like, this is the, this is the, mode that it seems normal and so they keep kind of going back and but you you can absolutely break that cycle but it is quite interesting I did a uh, family tree chart with one of my girls and had her draw her family tree and then list you know eating disorders sexual abuse um even just degrees did people go to college did they graduate high school were they overweight like just all these you know family or person conditions. And then of course, relationship pattern. And she said, everyone up to her grandparents, she didn't know her great grandparents as easily, but every single woman in her entire family, including aunts and cousins had eating disorders. Wow. And it's just, again, so fascinating to see how it, the normal can bleed and how once you break that cycle, you're truly changing generations. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's so powerful. And I think it's mm. important to kind of address like, you know, we learn through like frequency and then we're usually chasing that frequency, right? Like that chaotic frequency, that, that traumatic frequency um, that we, we all, we all know that, but you no, know, and even like on a quantum, like physics um, level, like they, they've discovered that pretty much everything is made up of energy. So, you know, before quantum physics, we all knew everything was made up of atoms, but even now with quantum physics, we know everything's broken down into three quantum particles. Their names don't really matter, but what, what what you need to know is that these quantum particles are just energy vortexes. 
So these energy vortexes literally make up everything. So they make up you, me, they make up the my background, right? They make up everything. So the words come out of my mouth, it's all the same stuff. So, you know, when we experiencing something like that and we have those thoughts over and over, we, we're literally creating that frequency and we're recreating that frequency. So when we're watching those things on TV, we're recreating that frequency. And that's why we usually go back to that frequency that we knew from when we were children. It really makes you kind of pause when we look at all of the children's shows and movies and how traumatic they are in terms of usually a parent is dying or both parents. But I, I like I'm particularly thinking of like Disney films, but it's like I can't imagine a Disney film where someone significant in the main character's life does not die or there's not something traumatic. And to what you said earlier, Denise, how are brains don't know the difference between what's on the screen and what's in real life. Like it really makes you kind of wonder, like, what are we doing to the minds of young children? Like maybe they do have a happy home, but here we are putting this, this stuff on TV in front of them. It's kind of scary. Well, the people, well, the people who rule us do that purposely because the children are the target. Every child, every child that's been born after the m- m- millennium 2000, they are so powerful and they know it. And that's why they're the target. Yeah, it went pretty deep there, but that's just from what I'm... No, you're totally yeah. right. And mm. I mean, it, it comes back to the energy as well of, you know, yeah. having a traumatic event or just having a chaotic environment. And then you find that energy in, in food. Some people will find it in food. And that's that's what I think stems off to the eating disorder. Some people will find it in abusive relationships. Some people will find it in alcohol. And it really, it doesn't matter what the vice is. It matters of what we're trying to say is, interrupting that process being aware of what it's doing and what you're feeling and that you're there's nothing wrong with you it's by design it happened and now you have the power to take control Mm. and to pivot and start to uh start to change and we all should be changing throughout our life i remember i'll never forget one time a friend of mine from high school said you changed so much and i was like thank you so much i really appreciate that (laughs) because who wants to be the same person they were 20 years ago right Unless you started out, you know, doing everything correctly and eating healthy and stuff. But for most of us, we all went through changes, right? Yeah. And that's yeah. that's important and should be embraced by everybody. So, yeah. Love, change the frequency from fear and hate into love and watch your life change. I, I know it's cliche, but the love frequency, like you find that love for yourself and you can love everyone around you and you can allow that in and express that out. Like that's the frequency to change into, change into love because we're all pure love anyway. I remember one of the girls I was working with was like, will I ever like not be triggered, you know, because she had just come from, I mean, it's horrific. She wrote a book about it. It's really powerful, but like, it's horrific, horrific. And, but she couldn't live a normal life. She couldn't leave her house. She couldn't go to the store. I mean, all these things. And I said, yes, you know, yes, you can. And I think my confidence is half of it. Like she has to kind of borrow my belief before she believes it herself um but what I said is the triggers will still be there you just won't care anymore because the stronger you get the more those triggers become a little annoying fly right and so it's been about a year of us working together and she's now like oh my gosh like I don't even think about that issue anymore or this annoying thing happened and it didn't spiral me for three to four days or you know and I think again Liz is I think we can keep coming back to this inner strength and this inner knowing this inner confidence and the stronger we are inside the less we have these emotional strings to everyone else around us and we can then raise our vibration right because like we're living up here we don't even notice those annoying (laughs) Mm -hmm. triggers or haters or you know whatever it is that's bothering Mm -hmm. us that day or used to yeah i think i think Mm -hmm. even using the word trigger right implies that it's making me feel a certain way. So I have to react. Yeah. Whereas if, if it's just a word or it's like a comment or an action that somebody else done, did, that's all it is. That's all it is to me is, Oh, you did that. That doesn't affect me. I'm not, I'm in an awesome lady anything. threat. Oh, sorry. No, go I'm ahead. in an awesome, I'm in an awesome lady threat, my journey. And she doesn't use the trigger word because when you say it to children and stuff, it's like you're pulling a trigger of a gun. So she calls it activation. And I'm like, Oh, I'm using that. So I call it activating now. That's Am I activating you? I say and stuff like that. So it's like, yeah. 
It seems treated, like so like, many people are so easily activated these days too. And it is just that, I don't know if it's a combination of just people being so into themselves and self-centered and, um, but it seems like people can just be activated. Like, why do we have to respond to everything? Like, maybe that is just like the frequency of, I mean, I'm just going to speak to social media. I feel like this frequency of social media is me, me, me and hate, hate, hate. And so maybe that's just what is being transferred. But I mean, I feel like that's like a huge problem. Mm. I think part of it is that, you know, everyone's stuck in that flight, fight or fawn mode that Denise was talking yep. about, right? And, you know, yep. it's not only trauma that activates it, it could be fear and what, you know, if you know, the uh, the news media is always activating like a 100% fear buffet as, uh, as we've heard before. And, you know, the, the, the lines for coffee and, um, you know, all those things are just, out the roof and everyone got to have their two coffees in the morning to wake up. Um, and so people are just constantly in that, um, you know, high cortisol mode where they just, um, you know, don't really, um, you know, they're not really thinking logically because when you're in that mode, just like Denise was talking about that blood flows out of your brain. And really the only part of that of your brain, that's really active at that point is that primal part of your brain. That's making those quick instant, you know, instantaneous thoughts of like, Hey, how do I get out of this? How do I save myself? Um, and it's, it, it can be a very aggressive part of the brain. So that's why I think, I think that's part of the reason why we see a lot of people just attacking people. Um, and part of it is just kind of like, um, they're trying to protect what they know, uh, because, yeah. you know, they see everything as like the system that is what's safe. And when people yeah. start to speak up about it, the, it's kind of like in the matrix that Mr. Smith takes over. Um, and says, no, like, this is, this is the system, we got to protect it. Um, and it, they, they start to attack you because they know that you are, you know, a threat to the system. Yeah, but what else are you doing? You're also making them uncomfortable. People are very, very comfortable with being comfortable. And if someone like us or anyone else speaks up, you're interrupting their comfort. And I don't want to be un uncomfortable because people are so comfortable in their comforts as well yes. and that's exactly. what's activating them you're activating them and making them uncomfortable and they don't want to be un uncomfortable yeah that's how I, think, I, say it. I think a lot of people too their beliefs right we know the beliefs are tied to your subconscious so yeah if you have certain beliefs and you're you're in that subconscious mindset all the time of you know getting your coffee and, and you believe the things that are on the news or the things that you're being told as soon as somebody you know tries to challenge that they want to be relevant so they just go they go right to their belief oh you're challenging my belief so you're wrong and hatred and whatever so conspiracy theory <laughs> yeah like <laughs> so i mean i think getting out of the subconscious into the conscious is a good theme um and we know that bad food will activate it or you know toxic uh toxic load on on your system whether it's from you know drugs alcohol uh, i always talk about it with my guys is is removing the distractions right all the, the stuff that's distracting you from, from being clear, having clarity, having purpose. Um, that's important for people to understand that, you know, you need to remove some of those distractions and, and yeah, they're put there, they're put there on purpose for us, for our men to specifically, uh, you know, not take action and just sit back and, and watch it on TV, be, watch the hero on TV, right. Not mm. be the hero in real life. So. Spot on. I think that's such an important part point because we, we all have a purpose. Like we're all, here for a reason and the most threatening thing is powerful people and people fulfilling their purpose every day and so if we can keep them sick and unhealthy with their food keep them traumatized keep them distracted um, that's really the perfect storm for limiting people's potential and so we we know from the line of work that we do that it really is just an attack on people to keep us small. And that is the strategy. Hmm. It reminds me too of, you know, as I mentioned, this, this um, sympathetic nervous system versus parasympathetic nervous system or fight or flight versus rest and repair is not just activated as Tanner said in a traumatic situation, but for those living in chronic stress, 
they're also always living in fight or flight mode, which is why short term decision making all the time, because I don't even have the capacity to think about something else. I just want what's easy right now. And if you think of the powers that be creating a system that that's what the norm is, like of course, everyone's self-sabotaging. Of course, everyone's in debt and overweight, you know, because that's what happens when you're living in fight or flight mode all the time. One hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, salt, we're gonna salt, sugar, and fat. That's the, that's the remedy, right? For yeah. when you're feeling stressed or you're feeling, you know, that, that energy of wanting to be in chaos, it's, it's the scientists have created salt, sugar, and fat is that magic recipe. That bliss point. Yeah. Mm. Genius. I feel, I feel like not only like those things can trigger it, but the system's kind of just designed around short-term thinking too, right? We got that, the quick pill or uh, <laughs> That a quick fix pill that you can take and you'll lose all your weight or you can fix your disease or you can do this real quick and you can cure your disease or, you know, all those different things that, you know, really it's just short-term thinking, short-term thinking, short-term thinking is just kind of shoved down our face. Um, but I think a lot of short-term thinking leads to self-sabotage because people aren't really thinking, where is this going to take me down the road, right? We also got that, that phrase that's so popular now, YOLO, you only live once, right? And that's like pretty much the self-saboteur's um, like catchphrase, right? You only live once and then they go jump off and like a bridge or something and they, they go down a bunch of alcohol and they, they don't think anything about it because you know that's just kind of the way society is. That's what everyone else is doing. You know, we, we were born watching our parents do it. We watch on the TV what everyone else is doing it. And so we just kind of go down that route. Um, and I, I think it's really important to be just kind of mentioned just like the society thing, like society is built in a way to lead you down these paths but that's not to say like we can't move forward we can't break free we just got to consciously break ourselves out of that short-term thinking and then look long term start to ask yourself in the moment is this going to lead me towards the life i want you know is this what what would a healthy person do like we were talking about or what would someone who is successful do, do right actually start to be conscious about what you're doing yeah, that self-talk. Is this building my dream or is this or is this building my nightmare? Yeah, that conscious awareness and, and that self-talk is so important. Anyone else want to mention anything else? Well, no, I mean, I'd like to mention maybe something about that transition from child to adult, right? We talk about that where, um, you know, children will look for pleasure, right? They're looking for pleasure at every turn, the next five minutes. And and we see a lot of adults doing that, right? We see adults, you know, looking for, um, they have nothing that they have planned to do. So they're looking for the next Netflix show to watch the next series and the next food and posting pictures of, you know, all their Halloween snacks that they're stealing from the kids. And it's, it's classic childlike behavior. So, um, you know, knowing that uh, people need to transition into an adult and an adult makes decisions based on five, 10 years in the future, planning things ahead, planning your next day, um, that'll set you up for success when you have a plan, right? One thing that I want to mention is that the brain isn't fully developed until you're 25, which is why I think it's so interesting that we are in school until uh, college and, you know, until 23, 24, because again, uh, our normal is a bit more solidified. And that's the only system we know. So it's just interesting how that happens, huh? Mm -hmm. Convenient. Mm -hmm. They know that. Mm -hmm. Most people, the rulers know that. Yeah. What we're taught in school, right? To uh, follow orders, to follow everyone else. If you if you give a different answer and it's technically correct, usually you still get it wrong, right? <laughs> like the, there's they're just always looking for a way to kind of get you in line and, and follow what everyone else is doing. Yeah. And I mean, I think right. school, we talked about it before. I know Nathan and I talked about it helping the children, but that authority that comes with, you know, sealing the deal in your subconscious, right? When you have a product on TV and you have a celebrity showing it, your subconscious is going to all of a sudden adopt it and be like, oh, that's awesome. I need that. You know, I have this awesome celebrity that I love. So I think school is kind of built around that. It's built around, you know, listen to the teacher, you know, listen to the white lab coat that you see on tv um listen to these authority figures and follow what they're doing so 
Um, now we use celebrities. We use celebrities to endorse all the products or to endorse certain um, things that happen um, that get put in you to be healthier. Um, we see it on Instagram with these influencers getting paid money to to sort of, um, you know, tell people that they need to do those things. So uh, I'm not going to get into to saying what, what you guys probably know what I'm talking about, but I think that's what school is is really what it's what it's built for is to form your opinion to follow the lead of the person who's a perceived authority and they determine who that is it's not yourself it's, it's stripping children of their power between the ages of what five to 22 23 children come out of these brainwashing centers and they have no power at all that's the work i'm doing right that. now i feel yeah, like this could right. be a whole a whole Not another one, yeah. <laughs> this is this is this is this is like my passion working with kids and teens like doing this work with them so because yeah, so there's a lot of brainwashing there well and that's part of my story too is i got my first real job right i was 24 23 i just graduated with my master's i'm off to change the world and then i didn't i didn't have anyone telling me what to do next and I didn't love what I was doing. And I knew that this wasn't quite it, you know, but like mm. I had to figure out how to lead myself. And that took a few years of trying to ask anyone, what should I do? What do you do? You know, <laughs> and they, they don't teach us that. And so it's no. truly empowering to gain back your own power, but it is not taught in the world today. It's going to be though. It is by us. I that guess. that is my it. dream to put mm -hmm. that in schools, make my own school and put it in there. Well, I have That's a teen journal if you need one. Excellent. We need to talk off air. <laughs> yeah, I, I completely agree with that because I feel like once I learned like the information about the subconscious mind, I was just like, so how come we aren't taught this in school? Like, how come we don't learn about like one of the most powerful parts of our minds, the part of our mind that creates programs and we, we learn so much from um, when we're going through school, which we're supposed to be, you know, learning and being able to increase our knowledge and things like that. And you know, it's once again, just goes back to just, it's how the system's designed. Um, it's, it's not meant really to empower us. Unfortunately, it's meant to make a bunch of followers and um, to really disempower us and to lead us into a part where we, we think we have to have someone else providing us a solution for things, but it, it all comes back to kind of what Bryce was saying, where it, it all comes in to where we have to take, you know, point, we have to be the ones to take the actions towards the life that we want. Um, you know, no one's going to be there to save us. There can be people there to help us. There's, I mean, there's so many people I know that have reached out for other people for help and they've been able to, you know, I did myself and I was able to move so much farther ahead in my life, but really at the end of the day, they could tell me all the things that I wanted to hear, but if I didn't do anything in my life and take those actions, then I wouldn't be where I am today. So, you know, it, it's a mix of two things you know, getting help is important, but you got to take the action. You got to be the one who wants that. And you got to be willing to give up the things that are no longer serving you. Yep. Yeah. That's goals cool. and purpose, have a goal or have goals and have, and have a purpose. And that's the best way to start. Yeah. I mean, we're taught, we're taught to go get a piece of paper and that defines who you are or, you know, to, to get the education uh, and that, that's going to be your purpose, right? When in fact, it should be what are you doing daily to create your future? Um, that we're not taught that we have the power to create what our future looks like, surround ourselves with positive things, right? Rather than just go to a school and get a piece of paper and then, you know, you're in the system then, you're in the matrix. Mm. So, yeah, great talk, guys. Yeah, that was awesome. All right. Well, uh, I think that concludes it. Uh, I don't know, Holly had to jump out a little bit early, but um, it was fantastic having her here and it's fantastic having you guys all here. Uh, so great hearing everyone's like discussions. I know I always learn so much and take so much from this. Yeah. Um, and I'm super excited to hear what we all have to talk about in the solutions part because I think that's going to be um, awesome. Um, anyone else want to say anything else before we drop off? Yeah, just reach out and ask for help. Oh, I say that all the time, but it's... Um reprogramming people that listen to this i guess to reach out and ask for help because the world's about to change we're bringing about the change and ask for help and you can change too and then that's gonna 
change, you know, us changing and you changing can help change the next person. So it's just one person, one soul at a time. Yeah, I agree. The reality and- is, is if it were easy, we'd already be doing it. And yeah. so we have to find people who are three steps ahead of where we are now and go hang out with them. <laughs> go well learn from them, be around their circles, <laughs> because um, if it were easy, you would already have have be doing it. And so clearly, you know, it's not easy for anyone to make this change. So go find people who are doing what you want to do and be mentored by them. Things, and things can make it easier by um, having different techniques and solutions. So we'll be talking more about that on part three. So um, hope you guys all have a good night and thank you for listening. <laughs>